mobile platform providers haven't provided the same kind of frictionlessness that Facebook has on the web. And you know, that's brought a lot of uh, awesome platform providers into the scene. Um, so they are here to uh, fight it out in front of you. Uh, there will be uh, blood spilled, there will be punches thrown, and we're gonna learn a lot about who's doing what, why these offerings are unique, and how they can help you build your social mobile game. So without further ado, I'll pass it to uh, Dean Takahashi, Chief Puba of uh, VentureBeat. Uh, absolutely amazing tech and game journalism site. If you haven't checked it out, you must. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I'm uh, Dean Takahashi. I'm the lead writer for GamesBeat at VentureBeat. And uh, we're a four and a half year old uh, uh, website devoted to tech news coverage. And uh, uh, I've been there about uh, three and a half years. Uh, and for about 16 or 17 years, I've been writing about games. And uh, I've never had as much fun as I have had at VentureBeat writing about all the, uh, the big changes and disruptions in the game industry. And uh, happy to um, have had our GameSpeed conference uh, last week uh, in San Francisco. Um, we got about 900 people to show up uh, for both Mobile Beat and GameSpeed, and that was a record for us. So uh, had a lot of fun with that as well. And uh, here we have a very interesting panel. This is the Battle of the Social Mobile Platforms. And uh, well, if you listen to Garrett uh, Davis, Gareth Davis, uh, just a, a second ago, then uh, I guess all you need on your your mobile phone is Facebook, right? I mean, that's uh, that's uh, that's going to do it for you, right? But uh, actually, these five gentlemen here um, have something that they, they offer as alternatives or something on top of, of Facebook, and I'm going to introduce them now. And on our uh, first on the right here is is Volker Hirsch. He's the chief strategy officer at Scoreloop, which was uh, recently uh, bought by uh, RIM, Research in Motion. Uh, next to him is Anders Evu, the senior vice president and general manager of Playphone. Uh, next to him is uh, Keith Katz, the vice president of monetization at OpenFaint, uh, which, um, which has also been acquired here by uh, Japan's uh, uh, GRI. And then we have Paul uh, Chen, the head of business development of Papaya Mobile, and Simon Jeffrey, the chief publishing officer at NGMoco. And I'm going to ask uh, each uh, person to introduce themselves a little bit more, uh, talk about what their company does, and then also, as the opening que question, mention why their particular solution in this space is unique. So, Volker, you're, uh, you get to start. Okay, hi, I'm Volker. Um, there was the strategy of the business guy for, for Skoloop. We're, uh, <clears throat> um, as you may have guessed, a mobile social gaming platform um, available across um, Android, iOS, and a couple of other others, and of course, very soon on uh, BlackBerry's up upcoming super platform. Um, <clears throat> we are also fully integrated with a couple of middlewares, um, uh, such as AirPlay, who I think recently um, renamed themselves Marmalade, and um, uh, uh, and a couple of others. Um, uh, besides that versatility um, and what we believe is leadership on Android, where we believe we're the most feature complete offering of, 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 uh, uh, of anyone, um, uh, underlying our, our tools, <coughs> which you can, you can get via an SDK um, uh, uh, from, our, from our website, free to developers, um, we have um, uh, virtual goods and virtual currency platform, um, which ties in um, to a variety of billing options, uh, which allows you, for instance, on Android uh, to avoid the pain of, um, of Google checkout and um, uh, choose um, uh, things like PayPal or credit card. Um, and uh, in an increasing number of countries, um, uh, uh, billing to carrier bill um, as well. I keep it as that. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I represent uh, Playphone. Um, many of you might know Playphone as a, uh, one of the larger companies in the direct-to-consumer space for, uh, in, the, in the old legacy business, as we call it, ringtones and graphics, but also uh, legacy games, uh, especially Java games. Uh, <coughs> Playphone um, has basically reinvented itself, utilizing its uh, D2C business, uh, taking its 32 million paying users in the community, uh, kind of converting it into uh, 
to a new social gaming platform. Uh, we, we're connected to over 100 carriers uh, globally. Uh, and taking the old D2C machine and the marketing machine, connecting that with billing, and then laying a uh, social mobile gaming platform on top of it, uh, we, we, we've come up with a very, very nice, robust solution. Uh, from, <coughs> from a social gaming perspective, uh, our focus is uh, clearly freemium games. Um, <coughs> we have um, launched all the features that uh, we believe uh, are strong in the market right now. We have a very significant roadmap going forward. But uh, synchronous multiplayer, direct billing integrations, subscription-based billing for Android, and also uh, SDKs that, that cover both Android and, and, and iOS, both on the native side on an, and on HTML5. We're also in the process of uh, preparing the launch of a Flash SDK, so that's going to be announced very shortly. And of course, uh, we're then uh, cross-platform, and uh, if you're not monetizing your, your content, I think you should come and talk to me. Thanks. Keith? Hey guys, I'm Keith. Um, what I would normally do is get a show of hands for how many people are acquainted with OpenFaint, but I can see absolutely nothing in the audience right now, so I'm just going to assume that everyone here knows what OpenFaint is. There you go. Oh, hey. There you go. Anybody, <laughs> Anybody know who Open Fame is? All right, cool. So we got, I don't know, maybe a third, a half. Um, so Volker and I were talking uh, beforehand about <laughs> this question that we that we heard we'd be asked, which is how to explain, you know, how each of our platforms is is the best platform. And it occurred to me that we we're all going to be saying a lot of the same stuff. So um, I thought the following. Um, there is a, a universal truth that applies to both life and to mass market social networks, which is size matters. And we have recently crossed 100 million users, which I think is probably more than the rest of these guys here combined. I could be wrong. Um, and uh, we're cross-platform. And, but it's, and, and why does size matter in this context? Um, size matters for a couple of reasons. One is because if you're a gamer and you want to be on a social network, you want to be on a social network where you're likely to find your friends. Pretty simple. Chances are your friends are on open fan. The second is... But your friends might also be on Facebook, right? Eh, okay, we can talk more about Facebook. <laughs> Um, the second is, if you're a game developer and you want to get eyes on your games, you want to go where the eyeballs are. And we have a lot of great tools for allowing developers to socialize their games, including GameFeed, this cool product that we uh, are about to launch to the public. Um, so I'll leave it at that, and I'll hand it over to Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith, for spilling first blood. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Paul, and uh, I head uh, business development for Papaya Mobile. And uh, as all of us on stage are, we're, we're a social gaming platform. Um, and for us, we have a more of an Android focus to us, although we are class platform, we're going cross platform as well. Um, so, um, you know, when we first created Papaya Mobile, we really had two goals in mind. And the first goal was really to uh, create a network in which the users are really engaged in the social community, one which promotes the sharing of user experiences across the different games that they're playing. The second goal, which is probably a little more relevant to this audience considering most people here are developers, is we wanted to create an end-to-end -end solution uh, for game developers that ultimately maximizes their return on investment for the games that they create. And we try to do that through three main ways. And that is one, um, minimize, de uh, minimize game development cost, uh, two, uh, effective distribution, and three, effective monetization. So in terms of minimizing development costs, what we try to offer to the developer community are easy tools to create social games. For example, we have a social game engine that allows you to create complex social games uh, in a matter of a month's time. Um, in terms of distribution, um, yes, size does matter, and I agree with Keith on that. But I would say that size matters um, in terms of your user base only when it's coupled with quality users, users that are effectively uh, monetizing for you. So hence, we've been monetizing off of our user base through the games that we've created ourselves for a little over two and a half years now, making you know, millions of dollars per year. 
um, now that we're no longer publishing games, uh, we're not in the business of creating games or publishing games on our network, that user base is now the developer communities to monetize off of. We want to share that, that user base with you. And that's why we've, we've put in a lot of effort to create viral marketing channels and, uh, and marketing promotional channels within our network for you to easily access this user base, which is highly monetizable as evidenced by our ability to monetize off of them as well. And thirdly, um, monetizing um, through effective billing solutions. Um, on the Papaya network, through our Papaya virtual currency system, there's been over 106 million Papaya virtual currency transactions on our network. Um, and we've done that, we've coupled our Papaya virtual currency system with a seamless in-app uh, billing solution that implements PayPal, credit card billing, carrier billing, Google's in-app purchase, et cetera, et cetera, such that once you have the user base, um, you can monetize off of them. And through our Papaya virtual currency system, we now have developers using our system that are making over $1,000 per day. And so ultimately, that's what we want to do, create an end-to-end -end solution that gets money into your pockets. Okay. Hi, I'm Simon from NGMoCo. Um, I take particular exception to what Keith said about size matters because I'm five foot four. So I'm <laughs> sitting here feeling somewhat insulted right now. <laughs> um, NGMoCo is three years old, uh, just over. We had a fairly fantastic celebration a couple of weeks ago where the entire company went off site and celebrated. Um, it was set up by video game uh, industry veterans who really saw something new, exciting, and explosive on the horizon, something that hadn't really happened. I myself have been in video games or been in the gaming business for 25 years, and I think what's happening now in this market is the most exciting thing in the history of gaming that's all, it's about to explode and affect every one of us. Um, NGMoCo has pivoted several times in its three-year history. It started life building um, premium apps for the iPhone, um, our first big money raiser, a big, fun, a big hit was called Rolando. Um, sold for 10 bucks, we thought, hey, great, this is a fantastic business. And um, we were one of the first companies, only a year after that, to move away from uh, premium paid downloads to the freemium market, to introduce social games. Um, everyone said we were crazy at the time, but a year later, everyone was moving in that direction. And now, when you look at the top 20 grossing in the Apple store, Generally, 18 of the, those top 20 grossing games are freemium games. Um, a year after that, NGMoCo was acquired by a Japanese company called DNA, um, who runs a feature a service in Japan called Mabage Town for feature phones. It has 25 million registered users. Um, it's the leading social gaming network on mobile in the Japanese market. And the two companies really came together um, because it's a meeting of minds, a meeting of common goals, both had a true understanding, a true passion around um, the mixing of explosive, exciting technology and the social gaming phenomenon, and what's happening in the mobile world with now 500,000 activated Android phones a day, um, all these people socially connected, always on, device in your pocket all the time. Um, we are building a platform called the Mabage platform for Android and iOS. It's um, in a, 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 small pri uh, a small beta period in Canada right now, and we'll be going live in the English-speaking nations in the next few weeks. We have an incredibly exciting ar um, arrangement of third-party games who are going to be part of that system. It's not just NGMoCo and DNA games. Um, we reach out to the development community, um, to, and I see some, some great partners in this room right now. Thank you, guys. We're going to make you proud. And, um, we think that by this holiday, we'll have a really compelling, exciting proposition um, that unifies gamers cross-device, cross-border, cross-territory, all around the world. Cool. Well, is there a start with Simon on this question then? I guess, um, uh, you know, games on, uh, we all know that games on Facebook are uh, doing relatively well. Uh, the, the virality is working uh, pretty, pretty well, even despite Facebook's crackdown on it. Um, uh, Singa has got 280 million users. Uh, it's profitable. Um, why, why is mobile lagging in terms of the, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, virality of, of mobile and all of the other good things that sort of come with it? Um, I think, well, I'll go first if that's OK. Um, I think it's a combination of many things. And this is going to be a multi-threaded conversation over the next 40 minutes or so, because most of these things all link back together. Um, it's, it's ease of use, it's um, number of connected users, um, 
user interface. Everyone knows how to use a laptop. They've been familiar with using a laptop or a desktop for a long time. Um, people have grown up using mice. Um, the smartphone interface is relatively new to a lot of users. And let's face it, we love you, love you Google, but the Android UI is not particularly easy to use or particularly uh, appealing to the non-nerd. Uh, you know, us techies, we love the Android UI, but to the normal person, it's kind of difficult to get into. And making those social connections, even booting up Facebook and getting your social graphs built in, isn't easy. Um, what we've seen in the Asian markets, and in Japan in particular, is that the best way to attract a number of users is to, as well as having your traditional Western social graph, which is your friends, your family, your social connections from Facebook and Twitter, is building up virtual graphs, building up a very, very large number of connected users that you game with, you connect with, who are probably more relevant to your gaming behavior than your actual social graph is. So having a consistent and ever-expanding number of user connections in your games is how you build virality. That's why we've seen, I think, much better, higher numbers of um, viral connections and viral growth in the Asian markets than we have in the West so far, because we've all been obsessive around Facebook and around the social graph. I, I, I think it's also something maybe a little bit more fundamental, which is that uh, on Facebook, I mean, you're, you're going there primarily to socialize first and play games second, right? Um, and it, the games naturally have a hook into the social network. And that doesn't exist on mobile. I mean, people are in the habit of going to the app stores. They've been doing it, you know, since uh, the Java days and going to their carrier decks. And that's a habit that's hard to break. I think there's a fundamental different expectation from the end user standpoint. And I think that what we all collectively are trying to get better at is making that more natural for a user. Like, users should go and play games on their mobile phone and expect a really kick-ass social experience. And we are really moving very quickly to make that end user experience much better. Um, so Paul, you were gonna say something else. Uh, Keith, yeah. I, I agree, but <clears throat> I agree with your comments, but I disagree somewhat. I think that the, the integration of, of the Facebook APIs for social into the mobile gaming is, is there, it's done. I just don't think it's been done right yet. No, it sucks. I, I think that uh, we, we've, we've imp implemented a, a social graph into some of our games, and we see that even small tweaking makes big results very, very quickly. So I think, I, I think you're right, but my, my, my point is I just don't think it's been done right yet. I've seen some companies out that are actually doing it well and better than many others, but I think we, the rest is yet to come on it. So my opinion on this is there's two, two primary reasons why virality hasn't worked as well in mobile. The first reason is fragmentation. Fragmentation of the operating systems, whether he's talking about Brew, um, iOS, Android, Windows Phone 7, et cetera, et cetera. Fragmentation of the applications that are available on those operating systems. Um, fragmentation of the form factor of the devices that are out there. All these fragmentations ca ca cause essentially pockets of users uh, all spread throughout the mobile ecosystem. Now, I think all of us on stage here are more or less trying to connect these pockets so that's one unified social graph such that we can all um, you know, create a more engaged user experience through the connection of those pockets. And that's something I think we're all working on. The second reason why I believe mobile virality hasn't worked as well is I think the K factors that contribute to mobile virality is different than what it is in the online space. For example, um, game invitations. Game invitations on Facebook are, are is critical for viral marketing um, in the online space. Um, but the customizations of the game invitations are really important, and, and how they transfer over in mobile is also very different as well. You have much less screen size to display a game invitation. How do you invite your friends? Do you do it through Gmail? Do you do it, do it through an internal email system? Uh, do you do it through SMS? Well, those are all new challenges, new things that we're trying to explore in the mobile uh, environment. When we looked at it, we found that, for example, SMS is 10 times more effective in terms of invitations than any of the other channels. That's a much larger contributor to K-Factor than anything else. That's a, that's a freebie for you guys. Should case. we do a K-Factor definition here, Paul? I mean, K-Factor, K, K well, for those of you who aren't familiar with K-Factor, K-Factor is essentially the, the measure that allows you to um, determine how viral your, your application is within a social network. It's based upon, um, you know, I guess it stems from original medical, medical biological terms in terms of a virus spreading um, its, um, its, its seed across other, other, um, other, other cells across. Uh, it's a horrible definition, but um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, people in the audience probably know how to find it better, but, but I, think, I think for those who know virality, we know the general gist of K-factor, yeah. 
I, I, gotta, I, I, I think, you know, mm -hmm. the, the <laughs> I'm not actually sure if that's fair to, mm -hmm. to, to, to ask that question. Mobile as an ecosystem, if we, if we um, um, uh, you know, kick the J2Me world where connecting was effectively impossible because it would cost you half a salary um, <clears throat> if you could actually get it connected in the first place. Um, so, you know, we have hardware and ecosystems that allow you to, to, to connect only for, <clears throat> for the last couple of years. Um, so when you look at um, what, what only, you know, people on this table here connect in terms of active users is we have something like 90 million game installs or so, um, 60 odd million unique users. Um, so you have your 100, your God knows where, but you, you, you're looking at um, uh, something on mobile um, already here, and there's and there's and there's others, and there's other countries um, uh, that top Zynga easily in terms of in terms of total installs. Now, um, the reason why virality isn't as ubiquitous on on mobile platforms certainly has to do with a lot of what's what's been mentioned. But I think we mustn't not forget um, that that you know this is this is in a, in a much earlier. Um, stage of its evolution than uh, uh, the, than online has been, um, and with a view to where it can go, um, uh, you know, uh, roughly 80% of people have have mobile connectivity in the world. Um, uh, roughly 30, uh, sorry, 73% I think have no internet connectivity. Um, so if you really want mass market spread, I you know suggest you you uh, uh, look at the mobile bandwagon here. Yeah, I kind of agree with Volker there as well because it. Is virality actually the right metric to measure this industry by, to measure the social gaming on mobile by? I, I would argue probably not. I think monetization is a far more uh, meaningful metric right now. So uh, maybe more of an unfair question again, I guess. Uh, how do you guys justify your existence, I guess, right? You're, 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 you're middlemen, right? You're, you're, uh, Look at all these people who came to see us. You're a social layer in between two other things, I guess, uh, between the platform owner and the game developer or the uh, or the user it's um, you know um, let's let's just have two people answer that in the interest of time I guess but. I'll take a swing at that one mm -hmm. um, you know we have over 6,000 developers using open paint and I don't think any of them want to get into the business of building a, a social layer underneath it it is a lot of work and it is not trivial <laughs> um, so it, you take a look at say what 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 game center is like and it's not so great you know and it takes um, a company with good gaming DNA uh, to really lean into it and make a product that game developers want to use and you know now the the focus is on making a product that players really really want to use and I don't think that I think very few game developers out there could, if they wanted, accomplish that. I mean, <clears throat> the whole middleware, the mid well, there's a middleware question, there's a tools question here. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you want to build a game with, with social features or an all-out social games with our tools, you can do this. Um, no one will actually see this, distinct to, to some of my colleagues up here. You know, you can customize your screen, so you can focus on what is a game developer you really do best and want to do, and that is develop great games, um, without having to, without having to um, put up with uh, uh, you know the intricacies of connecting to a variety of networks, into a variety of billing options, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at the overall budget, that would easily then start eating into it, um, uh, with the effect that the games would not actually be as good as they could be um, because you don't have the budget to finish them off and. I think you know that the same is is goes for for any you know on any platform for any good gaming engine that people use they use it because it makes their life easier and I think that's the reason why we're here. I'm oh, going to keep wait, my answer. We're going to do just do two, right? <laughs> um, but you can get the next one here. Um, let's see. So, um, what's what's a good example of a, a well-executed game on your platform? And like, uh, what's better about it in terms of engagement or or monetization? Uh, Paul, why don't you start with that then? Sure. Okay, I'll take this one. Um, an example of a game that's done really well. So. 
I'm going to give an example of three developers in China that just graduated college, never developed a game in their lives. Um, they picked up our game engine and started creating a social game called Treasure Fever um, in a matter of about two months. These guys have never done any, any kind of game development ever. Right? They, cre they created a game on our, on, our, on our game engine, and they now make over $1,000 per day um, off of our virtual currency system and our game engine. $1,000 per day for three kids in China is like mind-boggling for them, right? They're, they're living it up over there. Um, and that's with somebody that's never built a game before. So when, you, when we put the tools that are available, uh, that we've created in the hands of people that know how to create games, the, the potential is even greater. Um, and, and that's ultimately how we provide value add to the developer ecosystem, is we make you money. And that's about as simple as we can, I can, I can, I can make that. So, I'm going to jump in here. Um, so we at Playform, we, we, we're following the uh, same principles we did um, in the earlier days on direct-to-consumer. So basically what we're doing, we're taking uh, the developer's content, uh, we're running it through a series of tests in the analytics platform that we have, and then, then we start driving the application out there in the market, whether it's with ad partners or through our direct marketing programs. So, so we're actually part of pushing the apps for the developer directly. Now, uh, we, we recently kicked off, I and mean, we have, we've been in business uh, running active games uh, since January. Uh, I think they, you asked for a specific game and, and an integration that works. I, uh, the first thing I did and I, I joined was to develop a, a, a sample app, so to say, just a self-published, self-developed, self-developed, self-published app, just to show off the platform and, and the features and the functionalities in the platform itself. So I encourage you, if you want to take a look at what's in the platform in terms of social integration, monetization, virtual currency, virality, and so on. We've integrated this into an app called Playform Poker. And I'm not promoting the app itself, but I encourage you guys to go and take a look at how we've done it uh, in terms of the integration, because that's the integration that's in our SDKs that we'll be able to, to share with the developers. Everybody can take a crack at this one if you want. Simon, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'd just like to say that while we haven't released our Mbage platform um, in the West yet, um, in Japan, DNA, our parent company, has this Mbage Town um, service. Last year, DNA, just to give you an idea of the scale of the opportunity here, in Japan, DNA turned over $1.38 billion just through this gaming service. 80% of that revenue came from in-app purchase. And that was spread across an ecosystem of only around five, 600 games. So games in Japan on feature phones through a community-driven social environment are making millions of dollars a month. I think, I think the next panel should be Battle of the Japanese Parent Companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, does, does everybody agree that that's going to happen here in the United States? The, the same kind of uh, success that uh, we've seen in Japan? We firmly believe that there are um, key indicators that, that behavior, uh, consumer behavior, um, carrier behavior uh, in the Western markets is following the Asian markets. I think we've seen things like um, the tipping points of 3G penetration going over that magic 40% mark where you see rapid acceleration. In Japan, 93% of all wireless users are on 3G networks. In the US, it's about 49, 50% now, but it's really motoring, it's really accelerating now. And the same across Europe. Um, we see, we've seen that with consumer behavior. Feature phones in um, the Asian markets, in particular in Japan, were kind of like our smartphones in the Western markets now. Feature phones five, six years ago in Japan had all, they had the app culture, they had apps. Users were shopping, they were banking, they were communicating, they were checking their horoscopes, they were checking the web, um, which it, we've only really started to do in the last couple of years because of the iPhone and now Android devices and of course, RIM devices. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> very, very much see those patterns being reflected in the West. Yeah, I think, um one of the things um, that we've seen um, also from Japan um, is um, these guys like, like DNA and Gree really, really understand um, uh, virality and social behavior uh, among players on mobile because they've been doing it for years and they're really, really good at it. And so we've been sort of absorbing a lot of that at OpenFaint and really iterating on our, on our product. Um, you know, we're making changes to our Android SDK so quickly now 
um, based on this amazing learning that we're getting. But we also realize that every market is different. Um, we're not going to do exactly what's happening in Japan. We're not going to do exactly what we're doing in China. Um, players are different and they want different things. We are not going to do a one size fits all solution because we really don't believe that can work. But we do see huge potential for um, a lot of improvement in, in social. So I do, the, I do the subtitles and Simon's on the wrong track, right? So, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, I think, I mean, I think Simon was dodging a bullet here a little bit because he didn't actually <laughs> say if uh, he thinks that the Mubaga town concept would, would, would work. Yes, I think we can all learn a ton both from from the Japanese mobile market in general, as well as from those incredibly successful gaming communities. I'm actually surprised that neither Keith nor Simon mentioned this, but um, social networking in Japan um, happens uh, to the tune of 98% on the mobile platform. Um, and um, uh, the two mother companies over there, um, um, uh, together with a, with a, with a, with a, with a few others, um, uh, battle it out there. So that's 98% mobile, the online, um, Online um, uh, in Japan means factually mobile. Um, what I, I'm personally not actually as convinced is that these fairly immersive, almost virtual world type models will translate as easily into the Western world. Um, and um, um, uh, I think there's there's been um, uh, there's been hundreds, if not more, um, um, attempts to actually bring incredibly successful games um, uh, from from the Far East across to the US, partially to Europe, and um, I think a lot of them were struggling. So I think what, what Keith's been describing is, is probably the right approach to, you know, look and learn and, and, and try and adapt. Um, uh, I'm not so sure if, if, if the all immersive model would work over here. What's a sort of quick list of features that you have to have uh, right now? Um, and then what, what would you say is, is good to have on the roadmap right now? Um, just one or two of you can answer this one, I think. Uh, I'm going to start this question off by answering mm -hmm. it in a different way. I would say that social features mm -hmm. um, are essentially becoming commoditized because everybody here on the stage is essentially offering more or less the same social features. Now, when OpenFaint and Scoreloop first came on the scene, you guys were great because you were first movers and provided some social features that were really important for developers to have because it saved on development time. But we've gotten to a point in time in which we have multiple players now offering the same exact social features. So ultimately, what is really important in associating your game with a, with a, with a social network? It's a social graph. It's the ability for your game to be virally marketed to that, to, that, to that user base. And what social features you use in order to do that, you know, that's, that's, that can be completely social network dependent. Because what we've done with our social features is you know, we don't look at what the market is doing, what OpenFane or Scoreloop or any of our other competitors are doing. We see what is the important social feature that a developer must have in order to tap our social graph to the maximum ability. And that's how we define our roadmap. I think a lot of this depends on your game. Um, a lot of it is a game, game design question. I mean, to give you an example, we had um, uh, one of the earlier games on, on our platform, which, which everyone had scratched their hats and, and thought, what the heck is this? It was a tiny little game, Code G. Um, it's a target shooter, 20 second gameplay. Um, and then what the guy did is he um, connected that directly. You, you didn't, once, once that round was over, um, <clears throat> you didn't land on some play again screen or, or, or high score screen, but he put you directly into challenge one of your friends. Um, and that was a very easy sort of one click thing once you connected this with Facebook, Twitter, your address book, um, uh, whatever you had. And you could literally see that game moving first through Europe and then over to the US um, um, on this. The game as such was probably an affair, it was, it was, it was very solidly executed, but you know, gameplay-wise, we don't, we don't need to discuss that that wasn't much. Now, a game like that arguably doesn't need you know, all the bells and whistles because it doesn't have that depth. Um, uh, so a lot of this is, is, is I believe, game design. Um, uh, and you know any any plethora of, of features that, that 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 can be offered um, uh, can be put in there. Um, but you know if you sprinkle some social features over a game that is just not very good, it will not get much better. 
so uh, ultimately, uh, what? So, 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 so I have one quick question. How, how do you monetize that type of app? It's great to have a short, small app that's fun, fun to play, viral. Uh, there's no social real aspect in, except for inviting your friends to the social Oh, graph. I think a peer-to-peer -peer challenge, okay, excuse yeah. me, is extremely but, social. No, okay, because so if then, you challenge your friends, so that is arguably a social get. This guy, I think, just monetized on, on ads. So, so and because he had, ads, because okay. of that challenge mode, he had, you know, much, much more replay than you would ever see otherwise. Um, uh, he maximized that impressions on that. Um, so, so we don't focus, uh, we, we have no ad support in, in our platform where we only focus on virtual currency and, and mo in app monetization through either direct uh, in apps or, or subscription based. Uh, so big difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But th this is why, I'm, why I was actually choosing this example because it's a little bit sort of like out of left field. Just to illustrate that, um, uh, you know, a social feature can can power all sorts of different games. It doesn't only have to be, you know, the fairly all immersive ones. I, I think that. Sorry, Simon, were you going to say something? I, I was just going to say that ultimately, what we're all doing here, um, we are enablers. We're enabling the development community <coughs> to build better games that monetize better. Um, we're doing it in different ways. At NGMoco, we're doing it in a games as a service approach. Um, but really, what we're all doing is building technology that enables developers to have a much better crack at making money of what they do and being more creative. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's tools that you can provide developers, you know, whether it's, you know, leaderboards or, or announcements, or whatever, but what game developers want and need is distribution. They want to have their games discovered. And what we've been doing for the last several months is talking to a lot of developers, especially developers who make free-to-play games who may be coming over from Facebook <coughs> to mobile, and we're trying to help them get distribution. And this game feed product that I talked about a little while ago is exactly that. It's a social game feed that appears on your game. You, we surface activities in various games throughout the network and allow developers for the first time to <coughs> get their game discovered without sort of paying for incentivized installs. Um, can we get the lights up and see if there's any questions people have uh, right now? They all left. Lights up. <laughs> there's no one there. Can we get the lights up, please? There we go. Oh, they're still here. Yeah. Okay. Right there. We've had a long discussion here about mobile games, and we haven't talked about the elephant in the room. Um, it's no accident Japanese uh, companies that are represented at the table, their parent companies are in Japan. The elephant in the room is telcos. Carriers in the U.S. don't get it on so many levels. Uh, I mean, we could start with bandwidth, where we think 4G is high speed. Tariffs for SMS are incredibly high. Uh, micropayments, the technology, the secure stuff's built into the phones for ages. Um, no, serv no ad server technology, no content, no transaction server services offered up to essentially middle layer players like you. Um, and carriers. I deal a lot with carriers and very senior levels at large. I have three cell phones here, three different carriers. I can't get a signal in this room. Because um, there were some moments where it wasn't happening for me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but could you comment on, on, the, on the carrier piece of this thing? Because, yeah. I mean, you know, you go to Japan, you go to Korea, and you're not in Kansas anymore. Well, I, I'll take a crack at this one. Um, I would dispute your premise a little bit. Uh, I think there are carriers who have seen the light, so to speak. Um, AT&T being one of them here. We have a great partnership with AT&T. We're now powering a lot of their Android games. Um, we have similar relationships with the big three carriers in China. Um, same thing in Japan. And we are doing that very, very quickly in countries like India, Korea. Carriers are coming to us because they understand the need for this type of service, and I think we finally turned the corner. I would, yeah, sorry, I would agree with Keith on that, actually. Um, I think carriers, ultimately, they want to enable a better user experience on their networks such that users continuously come back and buy Verizon or AT&T devices, right? So if they can do anything to enable their user experience to be above another particular carrier's, then they're going to do it. Now, creating a, say, a social environment where you get to play games with all the different people that are on this particular uh, carrier, um, that's something really enticing. I think carriers are really beginning to realize that. And same with Keith, we are we're, we're, we're going aggressively out and talking with carriers, striking partnerships in China, in Europe, in South America, all these places. Yes. I, I completely agree with that. I think uh, what you're seeing is uh, 
I, I, I started, uh, I, I started a, a mobile gaming company uh, in the U.S. in 2000. Uh, we, it was called iPlay. Uh, we sold it to a company called Old Brown in 2007. But uh, in the early days, the, the carriers were very focused on getting the content on deck. They wanted to build their own portals. I think they, they got burnt or kind of disappeared over time as the legacy, the J2, me, and the brew business started dying off. Uh, what we've seen coming in the background is that the carriers are coming extremely strong. They're starting to build up their own plans and strategies around how they're going to put gaming back into their into their portals and monetize it. It's not necessarily just for the, the entertainment value, but it's also they have huge mandates internally to drive data usage in their network. And they're seeing that a lot of data coming is, is coming through games and, and content. The, the only thing that's different this time around than the first time is there's also, uh, I think they've, they've learned on, along the way, and they're now they're open to, to communicating with other platforms. So they, they, they want the Android users to be able to play against the iPhone users, even, even users that are online. So they're looking cross-platform, cross-carrier, cross-continent at this point. That's what about, what about the other uh, elephants in the room that are like uh, you know, Google and Apple and uh, Facebook? How do you stay ahead of them now? I think one of the limitations that um, the, the platform providers have in terms of creating a social network is that they're gonna focus all their energy on their particular platform. So Game Center is gonna focus on making Game Center the best experience for Apple users. If Google decides they end up wanting to roll out a, a similar solution, they're gonna make sure that particular solution is best enabled for, for the Android operating system. The chances of them spending the time and effort to ensure their Android users match well with an iOS user, the ability to, to, for them to, or the desire for them to create a, a desirable cross-platform experience is, is, is fairly small, at the, my belief, at, at least. So that's why I think you know, third-party players like, like us, um, we, like as, as I said at the beginning, we connect the pockets. We're trying to connect the pockets so that we can create a true social graph all throughout the mobile ecosystem. The three, three of you guys up there have chosen to uh, sort of tie up with a, a larger company now. Um, so for the, the two who are, are left, uh, what's sort of the, the benefit of being independent? Should I take a first stab at that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the reasons why we've tried to remain independent um, as a social network is that we fundamentally believe that if you own a social network, and then you also publish games on that social network, there's a significant conflict of interest. Because there's nothing preventing you from taking traffic from one particular developer and driving that traffic to your own games to increase your own revenues. That was the conflict of interest that we saw when we went out and we talked with the development community. So hence, we took the strategy of remaining independent and making sure that the developer's best interests are also put at the forefront of our, of our company priorities. So, so we're heavily VC funded, uh, but uh, on top of that, we also have a, a strong legacy business from the D2C that's still driving and bringing in the significant part of the cash. Now, having said all that, if there are investors in, out here that wants to provide an exit of, of significant kind, just see me afterwards. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to join the, the Japanese team over here. We have a, another question from the audience here. Uh, anybody else have a question? Um, so let me we've got maybe quickly circle back to okay. this carrier question. It, it's, it's I think what what the carriers are realizing is that, you know, on all of the big smartphone platforms or on the smartphone ecosystems in gaming, they don't actually see anything. Um, people use up their data and, and they don't see anything, which is why you have those discussions where they basically want, um, uh, 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 you know, the Facebooks of this world to actually pay for data um, uh, uh, that, that all the users consume from a carer's perspective for free. Um, but so, so when they when they um, uh, start speaking to us, and I'm sure this is this is this is true for for anyone here who's working with carers, what they were looking at is to find solutions um, uh, that address some of the key issues that you find on on um, uh, some of the um, OEM app stores, this discovery, um, where you know we can aid with with social discovery. There's a much higher chance that you're more interested in games that your friends might be playing for the simple fact that you know, you're more likely to share interests with your friends. So if a carrier can actually come and <clears throat> put out an app store that can do what any other app store can, plus provide you know, this social relevance around it, um, uh, that is something that they, that, they, that they will do. We have something, I don't know, a showcase that's live in CSL and in, 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 in Hong Kong that's doing just that. Um, <clears throat> but- um, We just got a couple minutes. Sorry, left. go ahead. So, 
Um, how do you guys uh, uh, split the revenues with your, your uh, partners here? There, Specific fairly. numbers? Is that <laughs> what you're looking for? <laughs> uh, well, like just uh, like in terms of like how do you how do you monetize and how do you split that revenue with the, your partners? So we we have a couple of uh, uh, products within OpenFaint that would apply there. One is OFX, which is our, our virtual goods storefront solution that we provide for developers who don't want to host a back end, and we do a revenue share based on virtual goods sold. Uh, and with game feed, um, we are still actually working that out. We want to make sure the product is perfect before we start doing anything with revenue shares. So on our side, uh, we do a ref share on our virtual currency system. So the example which I stated earlier, the de three developers in China which are making $1,000 per day, um, we get a small cut of that. Um, we are also one of the only social network providers to also couple our solution with an offer wall uh, type solution on the Android. And if a publisher, or oh, sorry, if a developer publishes that offer wall, we do a revenue share off of that as well. Yeah, it's the, the same principle with Mabage. Um, we do revenue share with development partners on um, in that purchase through the single virtual currency that's consistent throughout the ecosystem. Um, but also, we provide APIs for advertising for off the walls CPA. Um, the same rev share applies to that. And then, lastly, uh, where where do you guys want this all to go, and and um, what are some obstacles you have to overcome to get there? Um, what is the roadmap? What are the communications channels you need or want? Um, uh, let's go down the line very quickly on that. Well, this end? <clears throat> I mean, it's one, one, one of the reasons why we, uh, we, we said yes to RIM was it, it offered us that tremendous opportunity to actually do a deep platform in, uh, uh, implementation on an OS level, while it's Paul, I might add, um, being, a, being able to, to work on um, uh, on our anchoring platforms um, um, as of today, Android, in the same way. Um, and when you look BlackBerry, there's a couple of specific things that only BlackBerry does, uh, which we will Im implement. Um, <clears throat> I think what, uh, what excites me about this and, and, and where, we, where we need to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where we need to work on, um, um, you know, with platform owners um, uh, is to, to, you know, not so much make the fragmentation go away because it won't, uh, but to make it less painful. Um, uh, and I think with um, you know smarter tools on smarter phones, with higher bandwidth, etc., there is um, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It will never go away completely, um, uh, but I think we can ease those pains. And then what Eugene said said at the very beginning, you know, virality will increase, um, uh, uh, and the, the the platform will basically unleash a lot more power. Anders? I think uh, my starting point is I, th I think right now we're creating a new industry. I think when, when I started in mobile gaming in 2000, we were doing WAP games. And uh, people said, what, what the hell, we want to play WAP, you know, play a game on your phone. And why? Now, looking at what we're doing right now with social gaming, a lot of it is, uh, is actually web driven. It's HTML5, or it's connecting to a server at any given time. So you get on a plane, a lot of social games are not going to work. So it's basically back to the same environment. But what you see now is a lot more speed in the network. So where we're going, where I'm heading with this is I think that, hey, we're creating a new industry for gaming, and it's, it's, it's mobile gaming is evolving to something else. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for several players here. Um, <clears throat> in the early days, there were uh, 10, 15 players. They're, they're now down significant today in the traditional gaming space. I think uh, there's a lot of niche plays that can be done. I think uh, focusing and specializing within certain aspects of Social gaming is is where you're going to see that 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 the companies are going. It's going to be it's going to be some really really big ones that keep gobbling up the others, but there will also be independent standalone ones that are very successful. The last three of you got one minute all together. <laughs> uh, we're good. Uh, we just need uh, we need to keep doing what we're doing, I think, and keep listening to developers and make that experience better for them, and uh, keep iterating on our player experience. And as long as the platform providers sort of let us do our thing, I think we'll be, we'll make some good progress. Really quick, our end goal is to connect every mobile user, every mobile gamer in the world, regardless of geography. Um, that's, our, that's our ultimate goal. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. We see this as being a once in a generation opportunity. Um, what we're building, we kind of see it like MTV in the early 80s. We're just changing the way things are done and the way people are entertained. Very good, thank you very much everybody. Thank you.